Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so my name's Neil. Um, I've been working with OSGI uh, since about 2003. Um, I've been involved with numerous uh, sort of OSGI expert groups. Um, I've been a, uh, I've the, the lead uh, developer of BND Tools, uh, which is one of the more popular tools for developing OSGI bundles uh, and applications. Um, I've been working with Paramus since 2011. Um, and um, recently become involved with the uh, JSR 376, which is the, the Java platform module system, uh, and obviously trying to encourage um, uh, better integration between uh, OSGI and the, the new Java 9 module system. Um, I don't know very much about LifeRay, um, except that they organize very nice conferences with excellent speakers, um, but uh, the technology uh, aside from the, the, the platform that it's based on, which is obviously OSGI, I don't know very much about that. That's not what this talk is about. This is a ModConf talk. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, modules from front to back. So uh, using Java and OSGI um, with uh, web components and building front to back modular systems. OK. So introduction. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So you very often see in the industry this kind of standard model here, um, the, the layered or the tiered um, uh, architecture, where you have, uh, you know, at the bottom end, you have a data access layer with some business logic uh, and then an application layer on top of that, and then your UI on top of that, right? So very standard um, widespread pattern that you see in the industry. Uh, but this pattern causes a lot of problems. Um, Any time that you want to add a new feature to your system, you have to, um, you have to cooperate with the teams that are walking, working across all of those layers. You have to cut across all of those layers because a feature tends to go from the UI all the way down to the data, um, and you're organized, your IT organization is horizontal across the technologies rather than within the business unit. So this architecture is encouraging your IT organization to misalign with the business. They're aligning themselves with particular technologies. You've got the web guys, you've got the back end guys, you've got the data, the data guys. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of friction with the business when that happens. But also, you get this kind of blame shifting. You know, the database people say, well, the database is fine. So it doesn't matter that the system is crashing. It's not our problem. Um, and fundamentally, this architecture is not modular. And we're here to talk about modular systems. Um, how do we know that it's not modular? Well, just try leaving out one of those layers. Right? You, cannot, uh, you don't get graceful degradation um, of the functionality when you remove a, a module, when you remove a layer. The entire system will break. You cannot have um, a system with no data layer, for example. So can we cut? with the grain rather than against the grain? Can we take our systems, and instead of decomposing them horizontally, can we decompose them vertically? So we have vertical systems for you know, typical business areas, inventory, billing, shipping, and so on. And these business areas, they have the entire stack, from UI all the way down to data access within, that within each of those vertical slices of functionality. The benefits of this, well, you're aligning your IT with the business, first of all. Um, and that, that tends to get your IT people working a lot better with the business people and the sponsors and getting better results. You can also add new features without co coordinating across multiple teams. Um, and finally, this is modular. This is a modular system, because you can actually take one of those slices out um, or, or add new features or evolve those, those features independently. Um, and you see this in some real systems. If you've been shopping on eBay, um, you, you might notice that when you're shopping and browsing for some goods here, I'm looking for some running shoes, um, you're on a system which, is, which has got this particular path here, www.ebay and so on. But if you then go and check out, you're actually on a completely different web application here. They've, they've, they've handed you over from one site to another site. Of course, it, the, a lot of the branding looks very similar, so you don't necessarily notice, but it is quite, quite uh, clear if you look at the details. You're on a new system here. 
So they've done a vertical decomposition um, into two different sites. That's not very granular. I mean, that's a nice, that's a nice start, but it's not very granular. Um, it's a very large grain uh, decomposition there. Um, and there's still lots of problems with that kind of model. Um, because each of those systems, the, you know, the checkout system at eBay, the, the, the shopping and the browsing system, they're all pretty monolithic still, and they have a lot of problems internally. So can we go uh, to, a, to a more fine-grained approach and design web applications that, that are truly modular from front to back, or top to bottom, depending on how you look at it? Okay, so let's talk about OSGI for a little bit. Overview of OSGI, um, most comprehensive solution for Java modularity. There is a talk in another room going on uh, at the moment about another approach to Java modularity, but I certainly regard OSGI as, as more comprehensive, the most comprehensive uh, solution. Um, the origins of OSGI were way back in 1999 um, with JSR8, the Open Services Gateway Specification. Now, that never made it to be a, a final published JSR uh, because the OSGI Alliance was formed and, and the work moved to that separate organization. Um, so in 2000, the OSGI Alliance was formed and they, they published release one of OSGI. Uh, and today we're on release six and working towards release seven, which will be published um, sort of middle of next year. And you know, we've been working on this a long time. We've got a lot of specs, we've got a lot of implementations, and we've pretty much got the back end covered in terms of modularity if you're doing a back end in Java. Now, what is OSGI really? Now, uh, I didn't notice Peter Crean's in the room, but um, one of the, the phrases that he sometimes uses, and, and he doesn't like it any more than I do, OSGI is, is sometimes called class loaders on steroids. So um, the idea that OSGI is all about creating bundles and class loaders and import packages and so on. Today, I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I don't care about class loaders or bundles or package imports and exports. Those things, they're important, but they're pretty boring. That's just deployment. It's just the, the enablers for the modularity. The really interesting part about OSGI, the important part about OSGI, is services. And the, the hint is in the name, the original Open Services Gateway, uh, the IIS initiative. So services are the enabler for a component-based software engineering. So services are robust, dynamic, and adaptable. So I have consumers and providers, and this is a service which is a kind of a flex point in your architecture between the consumer and the provider. And they're both working against a contract, which is defined usually in terms of a, a Java interface. How do you implement services, or rather, how do you implement these components in the OSGI um, uh, component-based uh, system. Well, there's many technologies within OSGI for doing this implementation. So uh, declarative services, probably the most popular, but not the only uh, approach. Also, you have Blueprint, you've got iPojo, um, PBerry, or you can drop down to the very lowest uh, level of, of, um, of API within OSGI, uh, the raw API, as it were. The important thing about this is Irrespective of your implementation technology for your components, they're all interoperating through this standard abstraction, which is the service registry. And the consumers and the providers, they are oblivious. So you can have a component developed in Blueprint, and it's interoperating with a component developed in declarative services, and neither of them actually knows or cares that that's happening. It's just, it's just another service that it sees out there. So, the problem that we have in OSGI these days, and maybe my font isn't great there, but um, we've got the back end covered, and we're building these nice modular back ends in Java, but nobody's building UIs in Java anymore, um, not in Swing or, or, frankly, in SWT or any of these um, uh, Java FX or whatever. The front end is going to be a web, uh, a web application. And from the OSGI point of view, we have this nicely modularized back end, but we have these monolithic, messy front ends. So we'd like to have a way to modularize both of these. So let's talk about web components.
So what are web components? Well, these are a, a relatively new um, family of specifications and features that are being added to HTML and the DOM. And the aim of web components is to add the concept of component-based software engineering to the web. Um, the key features that, that comprise web components are custom elements, uh, and this is the ability literally to define your own element. So you know you probably know all of the standard elements like select and uh, and input and so on. Um, you can uh, using the custom element specification, you can define your own uh, custom elements um, that extend from span. Um, Shadow DOM, um, a, a way of creating a DOM behind the custom element that is disconnected from the main DOM. Um, HTML imports, so just a new way of, uh, of, of depending on assets in your, your web system, uh, and HTML templates. So the key point, the key idea here, is that you're taking a bunch of components and you're assembling a web application from those components. So a truly modular approach to developing web applications. Here's an example. So um, there's this component here, which is called Gold CC Input. And this comes from Google's Polymer collection of, um, of components. Um, and it's designed for credit card input. And it does the basic, um, uh, what's it, the checksum um, on the, um, uh, the checksum on the digits to make sure that you've entered a valid um, credit card number. Um, and it also works out what type of credit card it is and displays the, the little icon as you're typing it in. So that's a, um, a custom element, gold CC input. A custom element must always contain a dash in it somewhere. That's how the browser knows that it's cust a custom element versus a, a built-in one. How do you implement web components? Well, a web component, there's many ways you can build one. There's a bunch of these implementation technologies out there. Um, there's Polymer from Google, um, there's Bosonic, there's Xtag, which is, I think, owned by Microsoft these days, um, there's Mozilla Bricks, or you can use the, the raw API. You can drop down to the, the lowest level of API, also called uh, vanilla JavaScript. But irrespective of which of these technologies you use to implement components, they can still interoperate with each other through a standardized abstraction. Now, this is starting to sound familiar, or I hope it is. So the point of this is we can take components from multiple different sources and compose them together. So a, a web component can be composed of multiple smaller web components and so on. And we don't really care about the implementation technology of each of those components. Now, a problem with the, the web components that you can download from, let's say, Polymer or, um, or any of these, these uh, element catalogs is they all tend to be pretty tiny in terms of um, the scope of what they address. So little tiny UI widgets, uh, well, not necessarily tiny in terms of size. A, a carousel may fill the whole page, but you, you can have a carousel. You've got things like credit card capture, as I showed there, address capture, charts, and so on. Um, if you want to develop larger components, richer components, that make up a more significant part of your application, then they're going to need back-end integration. They're going to need data. So how do we ensure that both front-end and back-end components are always deployed together? Because if you have a front-end component that needs to talk to a back-end component, but it's just not there, um, you're going to get strange network errors. OK. Let's talk about application assembly. Incidentally, I should have said that the format for this is I'll be doing some talking for a bit, and then we'll go on to the, the exercises sort of in the second half of the, uh, of the talk. So application assembly. In OSGI, we assemble applications by um, putting all of the components, all of the bundles that contain the components. Remember, a bundle is just a shipping mechanism for components. Um, into an OSGI framework, and the application just kind of emerges from that. Uh, you know, those components, they start to wire up, they detect services, they produce effects, and so on, and the application emerges from that. Um, but how do we create the application that we actually want to see? It's kind of like cooking. You've got to throw in all the right ingredients to get your stew, but 
which ingredients do you throw in and which ingredients do you not want to put in there. Um, the problem is that not all the bundles are, are particularly interesting. A, a large application can contain a lot of bundles. I mean, Eclipse, uh, Eclipse is an extreme example, but it can contain sort of thousands of, of bundles. And you don't want to have to, to write um, huge lists of these bundles that go into your application and maintain all the versions of those and so on. So in any application assembly, you have a very small number of bundles that you actually care about, you know, your checkout and your shipping bundles. And then you have a large number of bundles that you don't care about at all, except the fact that you need them. Right, so they have to be there, they're important, but you don't really want to have to manually manage all of these things, the data access layer, the, the logging system, the config, and all that kind of stuff. They have to be there and need to make sure that they're there, but you don't want to keep track of all of those um, manually. You just want to keep track of the things you care about. So we want to use some system of dependency resolution. We want to take those things at the top level that we care about and get a dependency resolution system that will give us a big list of all the things that we need. If this is what I want, these are the things you have to have in order to get what you want. And there are existing tools that do this, tools like Maven uh, in the Java world, uh, NPM, Bower, and so on. The problem is these tools are bad. They're really bad. They do a bad job of producing um, sets of dependencies for a system. Um, and the main reason for this is that they use identity for dependencies. Now, I think Ray talked a bit about this in his talk. Um, I didn't catch Ray's talk, but I caught it two weeks ago at another conference. So, um, Existing package managers nearly universally use identity of, a, of another module uh, for resolution. So module A depends on module B. And the result of that kind of system is fan out. And a fan out is this. You know, A requires B and C, and B requires D and E, and those, depend, uh, those require H, I, and J, and so on. And you have this, just by installing A, you have a very wide fan out, and you have to have all of these bundles installed. And this results in the typical effect with Maven. The first time you run it to build a little two-line uh, Java application, it has to download the entire internet, or it certainly feels like that. The other problem is conflicts. So a very common problem when you're, you're trying to create a, 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 you know, assemble an application using something like Maven is you're going to end up with multiple versions of the same library, particularly these commonly used things like SLF4J or Guava. Um, and in a traditional Java application, you simply cannot have both version 162 and 174 of SLF4J. It's not possible. In OSGI, it's possible, but it's still not desirable. So that's a bad problem with these package managers. The OSGI approach to this problem is capabilities and requirements. The so fundamental concept of capabilities and requirements is you don't depend on who something is or who somebody is, but you depend on what they can do what they can do for you. So let's say I have a, a module or a, some kind of resource here. This doesn't necessarily even have to be an OSGI bundle. Some kind of resource, and it can provide a capability. It can provide a display. Um, it's a, this is a namespace. And I can attach some attributes to the display. So I can say width and height. Presumably, this is pixels. Um, in another resource, I can re declare a requirement. And I repeat the same namespace. So this means that these things are potentially matchable. Things that are in the same namespace can be matched together. And then I provide a filter. So the filter width is at least 800, and height is at least 600. So this requirement will now match this provided capability. So this is a way of saying not who you are, not depending on who you are, your identity, but what you can actually provide, in this case, a display. And the important thing about this is the thing that's doing the requiring, sorry, the one on the right that's doing the requiring, doesn't necessarily care who is providing the thing that it wants. It just needs a display, and it doesn't really matter who it gets it from, as long as it's got the appropriate attributes. 
and it's flexible enough to deal with an uh, you know, multiple possibilities there. The namespace of these things is arbitrary. Um, there are some reserved namespaces, so uh, the, the names that begin with OSGI dot are reserved. And it's a completely generic model. So this capability requirement model is not limited to OSGI, it's not even limited to Java. You could do this with .NET assemblies or with native libraries. Um, and as I said a couple of times, you're not depending on who a module is, you're depending on what it can do for you. Although, incidentally, with the same model, you can, if you want to have an identity dependency, you can, um, and you just have a namespace called OSHI.identity for that. So if you want to ex depend explicitly on that named module, you can with the OSHI identity namespace. So where am I going with this? Well, let's say I have a capability in a module over here that provides a capability Sorry, the module provides a capability of web service. And the web service has a name attached to it, shopping cart, and a region. Um, on the right-hand side, I have a module that needs a web service. So modconf.webservice, and the web service name is shopping cart, and the region equals either EU or UK. And I'm kind of sad that that's actually even necessary as a, as a or there these days, but little, my little Brexit joke, I have to get in one every talk. Um, it'll be Trump jokes next. I can't think of anything funny at all to say about Trump. Anyway, um, I digress. So the problem with this is that these headers are pretty tricky to write. So if you look at the syntax of that, you don't want to be writing that manually. It, it, it's tricky. It's a kind of an LDAP-based filter. Um, it's, uh, uh, you have to write the, the namespace, semicolon, and then it's filter colon equals, remember the colon or it won't work, and so on. So it, it's pretty fiddly. This incidentally is, is declared in the OSHI manifest. Um, so in BND 3.3, we're able to generate those things from Java annotations. So the Java annotations we can put into our source, and you can define your own annotations that will generate your own provided and required capabilities. But for this, um, this workshop, I've defined a web component um, annotation and a require web component annotation. So if I'm defining web component in a class called cart component here um, with a name, and then somewhere else in my shopping component, which will require the cart component, um, I have that annotation, then BND is going to generate all these headers, and it's going to enable us to do a, a, an assembly of a web application using the BND resolver. Some final pieces to put this into a whole, um, into a whole working system. Um, when you create a web application, you can't just pile the components into a, into a bucket and expect a, an application just to emerge. You need a top-level application that's going to assemble them and wire them together you know, with, with this component at the top left and this component in the bottom right and so on. Um, so you would write some kind of shop application here, um, and you can have multiple requires. So you pull together all of the requires there um, for all the web components that make up your application. Um, incidentally, that doesn't work um, uh, before Java, Java 8. You can't have repeated annotations. You can in Java 8. BND doesn't yet support generating this stuff for uh, you know, generating this stuff for repeated annotations in BND 3.3, but we're going to be having that, that support soon. Um, and then you have these these very large component libraries uh, or catalogs, like Polymer, for example. There's there's hundreds of components in the Polymer uh, catalog, and those are too big for us to go and individually pick out um, web components and so on. Um, and so there's another specification, actually, it's not yet a specification, it's, a, it's an RFP, which is a quite early stage um, proposal at the OSGI uh, Alliance called RFC 171 Web Resources. And this RFP um, is useful for uh, declaring dependencies on the assets that make up your application. Um, not necessarily web components, but it could also be abstracted to um, things like CSS, so if you're using Bootstrap, you can pull that in, jQuery, Angular, and so on. So 
you declare your dependency on the polymer ion web resource. So polymer is divided into different uh, um, different uh, sets of, of components. They've got iron, they've got paper, they've got gold, um, and so on. Um, so I'm depending on iron and paper, and I'm also pulling in Bootstrap um, to get my styling. Um, and once I've done this in my application bundle, um, I now know that I've got a predictable URL to put into my um, to put into my uh, HTML. So I don't need to wonder about what path these re these assets are going to be underneath my web server. That's defined by the web resources spec. And so my href is going to be OSHA on root web, web, res web resource, um, then my BSN, my bundle symbolic name, my bundle version, and then the CSS file that I want from that, uh, from that web resource, the, the Bootstrap web, web resource. OK. So in terms of the workshop, what are we going to do? Does everybody have these requirements? Now, you don't necessarily have to work through all of this if you just prefer to spectate or if you prefer to pair program. Um, I will be doing the exercises on the screen as well. Um, fairly simple exercises, and I'm not going to be asking you to write lots and lots of code because there isn't time for that. Um, and I obviously also have limited scope to come and help individuals. Um, but the requirements for the workshop, um, you need Eclipse. Um, Apologies if you prefer IntelliJ. Most of this stuff does just work with, with a Maven build and so on. Um, but for this, uh, this workshop, we're using Eclipse. Um, I do recommend the latest released version of Eclipse, which is Neon. Um, but we do also support back to Eclipse Luna, if that's what you have already installed. Um, you require BND Tools 3.3, which is also the latest release of uh, BND Tools. Um, you require Java 8. Uh, now, if you don't have Java 8 yet, I think you're going to have to hurry up and install that. I hope the Wi-Fi can, can take that. Um, and we're going to be doing our testing in Google Chrome. I guess one of the open questions about web components is the level of, um, level of support for the various specs, because they're evolving specifications. Um, and as always, with the, with the browser landscape, you have varying levels of compliance with those specs. Uh, amongst uh, the browsers, but Google Chrome um, is going to be your best bet for testing this stuff. Okay. The files that you were supplied, um, I, I hope you got the USB key. Um, if you didn't, um, I can give that to people, or the easy way to get hold of the files would be to check out this, uh, this um, repository from GitHub. So I'll leave this on the screen for, for a few minutes. Um, what we have is um, the initial state of the workspace. So this zip file, initial.zip, um, that's the starting point. So my next slide is going to tell you how to import this into your Eclipse. Okay? So if you're wondering what to do with that, um, you don't need to unzip this. Just import, we're going to be importing it directly as a zip into Eclipse without unzipping it first. Um, if at any point you get stuck, um, you have a series of step uh, n.zip, so step 0, step 1, step 2, and so on. Um, these, are <coughs> these contain the, the state of the completed exercise um, as we go through them. And then the completed.zip, that's just the whole workspace with everything completed if you just want to look at the final state. And um, this, um, this GitHub URL, if you check this out, it's got a bunch of uh, tags on there. Um, so there's tag. Step zero is the initial state, and then step one is the completion of step one, and so on. So first, the setup. Starting with an empty Eclipse workspace. Please make sure it's an empty Eclipse workspace. Don't mix this up with the code you were working on for your customer yesterday, yesterday or whatever. So a nice, new, fresh Eclipse workspace. We're going to go to the File menu, Import General Existing Projects. And then within the dialog, we're going to select Archive. Now, this is the bit that most people um, are not that familiar with. So I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to say File, Import, Existing Projects. And then you click on this, um, uh, this radio button here, Select Archive File. And you browse for the initial.zip. Um, if I open that, I think it's in my Dropbox. Yes, it is. Uh, initial.zip. 
and it comes up with the, uh, the projects to import. Now, I can't import them because I've already got them in my workspace, but you will see these projects, and you click Finish. Okay. Just leave this up on the screen for a minute. So select archive, browse for initial.zip, um, ensure all of the projects are checked, and then click Finish. And you should see the, the projects get imported into Eclipse. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to immediately run what we've got before we start doing any work. And so you're going to open up this file called um, polymer underscore bookstore.bnd run, which is in the org example web app dot bookstore. Um, so open up that BND run file. That's a, a BND run descriptor. I think you've probably seen this editor a few times in, in the other talks that have been going on. Um, in this case, you don't need to resolve. It's already pre-resolved, but you could do a, a resolve operation, and then you run. Resolve, by the way, means uh, click resolve. You get a dialog. You click finish, and then you click uh, run. Okay. So do a resolve and a run, and then once that's running, you go to Chrome, open up localhost colon 8080. Right. So leave that on the screen for a minute, and then I'll show uh, on my screen how this is going. Any questions, problems? Yeah? Uh, it should have been, there were USB keys that were distributed around. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, do you want to do a Git checkout? Are you familiar with Git? Uh, what I what I quickly do is I'll just put a um, uh, put a. Does it, does anybody have a zip file? OK. I didn't ask them to extract it. I should have said explicitly to them, don't extract it. OK. Um, uh, oh, boy. OK, I recommend then um, do the git checkout. So I definitely put, no, if it's the zip file, it's um, uh, What you would do, OK. Looking up github.com. Hmm. I'll come and have a look. Um, so how did you get the zip file? You didn't, did you import the projects directly from the file? Oh, you, you, uh, you checked out from Git. Uh, just. Everywhere. Okay, so the import is not. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this was a zip good. from uh, GitHub. You, uh, you did a clone from GitHub, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, does that? Okay. Yeah. Oops. Very loud. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Feeling bad. Um, It's not the yeah, I don't know what because it's it's not these aren't even appearing as Java projects. Each of these should be a Java project, so it's gone into a two nested directory structure. Yeah. Okay, pretty major technical hitch then that the uh, the 
the USB key didn't contain the zip file that it was supposed to contain. Uh, I tell, what I can do is I can put it onto my own USB key and pass that around. Hopefully, some people can sort of copy it. Um, probably, we're not going to be able to do that much in terms of a workshop. Hopefully, some people could, uh, can get that done. Um, I'll quickly do that, start passing that round, and then just work mostly off my own screen. I have to apologize for that. Yes? Well, it is on Git. So you just, you just git clone. Let me do that. Let me do that. So git, but it, I can't go to GitHub. Yeah. So that's the, if I do that. Yeah. So, okay, so first step, um, git clone. GitHub, uh, sorry, git at github.com, colon nj Bartlett slash modconf 2016-workshop.git. Work that should clone. Assuming that I can actually talk to GitHub. I think my internet's not working. I'm on the Wi-Fi as well. OK, OK, that's working now. So after the checkout, what you should be able to do, uh, so modconf2. So after you've cloned that URL, and I'll put that back up on the screen in a minute, um, you should then do file import existing Existing projects, so go to uh, projects, modconf 2016 workshop, like that. Is that I'm sorry? Is that no, it isn't. I'm going to have to rewind that, but I can do the import first, and that'll, that'll, be work, that'll work fine. So that, if I just say uh, git checkout minus b lab based on step 00. zero. Oh, I need to be in it. OK. So I'm now at step zero. So the steps to repeat would be, yeah, yeah, if, you're, if you know how to do that, yeah. I'll leave that up. Um, it's unlikely we're going to get as good progress as I'd hoped for. Um, so I'm going to try to carry on on my screen, um, despite everything, and see how we do. So hopefully you can follow along by, by watching what we're doing. And you can, you can always come back to this after the, uh, the presentation. OK, so what would happen if I did a resolve and run? So go into bookstore, open polymer bookstore.bnd run. Now, the interesting thing here is we have a run requirement for a single thing, the web app.bookstore. Um, when I do the resolve, the resolve calculates all the things that I need in order to get that to work. And the resolve gives me, let's just collapse the optional stuff to give me more space. Um, the resolve gives me this list. So quite a few bundles in there, um, uh, except uh, I need to F5 because I'm still on the. I'll tell you what, I'll go back to this workspace because this was the one I prepared. So coming into um, Bookstore BND Run, do the resolve. 
I'm only asking for the bookstore. I get a bunch of things like Jetty, Servlet API log. Um, there's my bundle I asked for, web app bookstore. I'm getting events and all that kind of stuff. But um, I'm going to get a functional application simply by listing a single bundle. Okay. Let's save that, run that. It's because the workspace, there's no workspace there. There's no BND workspace, so it's got no idea about any of these dependencies. I'll ha I'm, I'm willing to look at people's workspaces after if, if you want to come to me and, and show me what you've got, and I'll try to help you get it working. Um, but I don't have time during the main talk now to, to help. Sorry about that. Um, so it's running, and if I go to Chrome, load this web page. Um, so OSGI Enroute is giving me this index page and tells me there's one application available. And I go into that application, and I get that, which is pretty basic and, and boring. But we're going to start adding to this. So coming into here, what's the next exercise? We're going to take um, the cart servlet, which is in the, um, the vanilla directory, webconf.cart.vanilla. Um, this is a web component implemented in vanilla JavaScript. Um, and in this cart servlet, we're going to add web component with the name cart list. So just to make things quicker, I will copy paste that. Oops. Now what do we have here? So in the cart vanilla project, we have first of all a servlet. So this servlet here, now I guess I could have used something a bit trendier than a servlet. You could have used, I could have used some of the JAXRS stuff. Um, but servlets still work. Um, I have a servlet component, and it's providing a kind of a, a REST API. I'm building up the JSON by hand. I know it's, it's yucky, but it, it does work. Um, so this is my back end, right? And it's a back end implementation of a shopping cart that I can get the things that are in the cart, and I can view the contents of the cart, uh, and I can add to the cart. Um, I also have in this same bundle, in static, I have component.js. This is a, um, a vanilla JavaScript implementation of a, of a web component. So, um, and this is why people don't tend to do it with vanilla JavaScript, because you have to put your HTML for the component inside a string, um, and you have to do some messing around with the DOM. But you can do it in plain vanilla JavaScript. So here's your template for your element. So you've got the H2, um, and I've got a table with a, with a bunch of items in it. And then I declare my cart list widget extends the HTML element. And I have to implement this created callback. There's a bunch of other callbacks in web components like the, to represent the life cycle of that component. But created callback basically hooks up um, my, uh, my, I create a shadow root for my uh, element, so it creates a little DOM within the, the, the um, custom element. Um, I give it my template, um, and then I'm going to be doing a, um, an AJAX query and filling in this table. And my AJAX query, um, I do a request to my servlet, so I know the path of my servlet here on the server, cartlist slash, slash servlet. I do a JSON request, and I get back. Um, I, generate some, I generate some HTML on the fly here. Again, this is a lot of stuff by hand because it, it's a vanilla JavaScript. But just to show that it's possible to do this without lots of fancy frameworks. Um, so I'm generating some HTML, adding it to my DOM, setting the inner HTML, and so on. So in order to make this work, I have to declare that I'm providing the web component from this project. So coming into, um, let me close that one so I don't get confused again. Coming into uh, the servlet, I'm going to say web component name equals cart list, uh, and just resolve the import there. So that doesn't do very much yet. If I go on to the next stage, Uh, add the web component to the app. So I've declared a web component from one bundle, and it's a full web component with a back end uh, bundled into it. Um, I'm going to add this as a dependency to the bookstore. So coming into um, bookstore, actually, I'm going to need to be like this. So I copy that into my buffer. 
I come into the bookstore app, I'm going to say require the web component. Again, just do a control shift O to resolve the imports. And I'm going to add my little bit of um, HTML. So in my uh, head of my index, I'm going to have to import the component JS. And then I actually finally use the, the, the custom element here, the cart list component that I've written. So add this line into, uh, go into static and index. So add this into the head just underneath the other script there. And then finally down here, I can just say cart list. Right. Now, this doesn't update automatically, so I'm just going to rerun that. Actually, I need to re-resolve. So in my run, I've, I've re-resolved. And now, it's bringing in webconf.cart vanilla. So it knows that the vanilla cart is needed. And it knows that because it's required by the bookstore, uh, the, the bookstore web app. So that gets added to the run. Save that, and it runs. And refreshing my page, I've now got my custom component. So I've got my cart with um, two quite good and one not very good OSGI books in it. Just the title I object to, that's all die OSGI. It's no good. Um, yes? I'm sorry? Yeah. So in the HTML, I've done two things. I've brought in the script, that component.js. That was a definition of the web component. Then I use the web component like this. So it's a very simple web component. doesn't have any attributes and so on. Just cart list. That's the name of the component. All right. OK. So let's go back to here. I'm doing for time. Is anybody got anywhere with their own workspace, or is it, am I just completely hosed here? I take that as uh, the latter. OK. OK. Now, what if we want to use some third-party components? I talked about um, these off-the-shelf component libraries, like um, Polymer. So in my application, I'm going to use two bits of Polymer. Uh, I'm going to use the iron. Um, uh, web resource, and I'm going to use the app um, elements. Um, so again, these are just subcategories within Polymer. Um, and I'm going to use, uh, what I want to be able to add to my HTML in the end is I want to use the app header, which gives me a nice um, sort of header bar in my web page um, with a toolbar. And within the toolbar, I'm going to have an icon, a couple of icons, actually. So um, going to have this Polymer icon and uh, a menu icon. Now, obviously, there are other ways to put icons into your HTML, but um, these, uh, these icon custom elements have a couple of additional features, like, uh, like click responsiveness when they happen to be part of a bundle, uh, part of a button, so a little animations and so on. But um, it's just illustrating that I can put these off-the-shelf components into my application. So um, first thing first. I will take this declaration of the requirements and add this to my bookstore application. So these annotations have been defined in another project, and they say I depend on the Polymer Iron web resources. And there's another bundle which is providing the Polymer Iron web resources, um, along with the capability for that. And the resource equals that tells us which resources within there that we're actually interested in. So we're pulling in that. And we have to just add the, um, the links to pull in the HTML files. So this is another um, spec within the uh, web components family. Um, it's not as essential as uh, custom elements, but this is HTML imports. So rather than importing um, JavaScript with the script tag, I'm importing um, HTML directly into this HTML, something that's never really existed before in HTML, this, this kind of way to import other HTML files. Um, so rel equals import. That's the new thing here. 
So link rel equals import, and then I'm going to put in the, so I'm using iron icons and app header and app toolbar. So again, I'm going to use a little bit of cut and paste here, which I know is cheating. Copy paste that. Now, interesting thing that's happened. I, I saved that and, um, uh, and I didn't do a resolve and so on. Notice I'm getting errors. So OSGI is now complaining that my bookstore is invalid. It can't resolve the bookstore because of an unresolved requirement, the required capability for the web resource with blah, and then the filter tells me what it's missing, the, um, uh, the Polymer app web resource. Now, that's missing uh, because I haven't added the Polymer app resource into the, uh, the bundle runtime, uh, into the OSJ framework, because I didn't do a resolve. I'm going to add those bits of HTML. And finally, I'm able to add this chunk of, um, of custom element. So add the custom element. Um, it's put, because it's a toolbar, that, uh, you know, a menu bar, I can put it above my content there and save that. So what I need to do is re-resolve. So when I resolve, I get this, uh, this new resolution that's going to contain, um, so I've still got my cart vanilla. And I've also got down here polymer.app and polymer.iron. So uh, BND has worked out that I'm going to be using these resources as well. So it's assembled those into the application. Finish that. Run it. Reload my page. Oh, uh, not quite right. I missed something. Uh, something is not quite right, but I'm not sure. It's not, not formatted the way I'd expect, but it's kind of basically working. Um, I think it's maybe just the, the, the size of the screen. No, it's not. Anyway. Um, so it's pulled, in the, uh, it's pulled in those components from a standard library. Okay. Next stage, um, I'm going to switch my, my implementation of the component. So I had a component that was implemented in vanilla JavaScript. I'm going to switch that to a, um, a more interesting implementation of a component using Polymer. So I'll quickly show you what a Polymer component looks like. And it's in, uh, I don't know why Eclipse is giving me random font sizes here. So I have my cart Polymer project, and the interesting parts are in the static folder. I have two HTML files here, um, cart item and cart list. So cart item. This is a definition of a, uh, oh, I see the problem with the index is I didn't actually save it. That's why it's, anyway. Um, so this is a Polymer definition of a, um, of a, comp a web component. So I have a com component, I use DOM modules. So I'm declaring a new module in the DOM, which is, in other words, a custom element called cart item. This is an item in the cart list, right? So it's quite granular uh, in the shopping, yeah, the cart entry list. Um, and I can define my style within here. And this style only applies within this component. Um, and then I have um, a bunch of things. And I have a repeating thing. So, um, well, sorry, no, I don't have repeat repetition inside uh, the item. The item itself is going to repeat. But within the item, I have the description and the price. And Polymer is offering, is offering me a form of data binding here. So this, um, this double square bracket here gives me a data binding to the item.price in the JSON that I get back from the server. Um, so that's essentially my template. So it's nice I'm able to write my template in actual HTML now rather than embedded in a string inside JavaScript. And then I, I do still need a bit of um, JavaScript um, at the bottom. Um, that, said, that constructs this Polymer thing. Um, and the minimum that I need any time I'm creating a custom component is 
this is field. So polymer and then is, and then that's the actual name of the, the custom element I'm defining. Um, the properties item, so this is to give me the data binding for the item that I'm getting from, from the JSON. Um, and I've commented out some stuff from error handling here. Uh, so that's the cart item, and then the cart list, defining another custom element called cart list. And here's the template. Um, I'm using some AJAX stuff. So Polymer contains some uh, custom elements for doing AJAX requests. This is actually an invisible element, but it's doing the AJAX request within the page. And I'm calling my servlet, cart list slash servlet, and data binding again. So the result from the AJAX. Um, so auto means it's automatically done as soon as the page loads, or rather as soon as the component is shown. Um, and it binds the last response from the server into the items uh, field here. Uh, and the, the, the double curly braces is a read-write property, whereas the double square brackets before, that's a read-only within the component. But this component needs to write to the items um, variable. Um, and then I have a div. Um, and then I have a template with a, with a DOM repeat. So I have a repeating template on the items field. Um, and for each item, I'm going to reuse the card item. So this shows you composition of web components. I have a larger web component that contains multiple instances of my custom element defined in another web component. Um, and then a very simple bit of JavaScript to the bottom. That, that is your minimum declaration uh, in JavaScript terms for a web component when doing Polymer. Um, and then it's just styling and so on. And I have to do an import, by the way. So because I'm using Iron Ajax, I have to do an import of the correct bit of Polymer using, again, the same approach. And I'm importing, as well, cart item. So cart list is using cart item, so it's doing an import of cart item.html. You don't strictly need to separate them into different HTML files because they end up being imported anyway. So what is this going to look like? In the cart servlet, it's the same cart servlet, but this time I'm going to say um, web component, whoops, web component, and this one is going to be name equals polymer cart list. Right. And finally, I want to use that different um, web component in my app. So come back again to the um, book store application. And I'm going to change the require web component. Instead of the cart list, I'm going to use the Polymer cart list. Save that. And I also need to get rid of the uh, import of the component.js. So uh, the script source for the component.js there. And instead, I'm adding another one of these um, HTML imports. Also in the head, it goes like that. Save that. Now, the cart list thing here doesn't, doesn't change. Right, it's the same HTML, but I've got a new component that's providing that instead. Now, when I run this, that, before I run this, I'm going to have to resolve. I come into the bookstore, BND run, do a resolve. The resolve has said, you now use the cart polymer. So cart polymer is being pulled in because my bookstore now depends on that. So you see that the application is... Uh, or sorry, the tool is assembling my application um, using my dependencies that are, that are between the requirements and capabilities there. So finish that, save, and run. Oh, I'm already running. So what I should do is stop that. Run again. And rerun. Yep, we reload the page. And I now have a Polymer. Now, Polymer components don't necessarily look pretty. And as you can see, I'm not the best designer in the world. But that is a component uh, developed in Polymer. OK. Um, so the workshop didn't 
exactly go to plan, but that is the end of the workshop. I hope you enjoyed following along with that. Um, I'll get on to my conclusions, and then uh, we can do questions, and then I'll just help anybody that wants to try to get it working, or, and certainly for the rest of the, the day I'm around, so, so please uh, come and talk to me if you want to try to get this working. Um, so my conclusion about this, um, this, this idea of front-to-back modularity, it's certainly not an original idea by me. Um, I think this is a very promising model. You know, Web Components is the, the closest thing that I've seen in the web world to um, the kind of component-oriented development that we have in OSGI. Um, this idea of using requirements and capabilities and assembling applications with them using the, this tool may provide a better approach to the kind of the web packaging and web application assembly than some of these existing tools like NPM, Bower, and Webpack. Uh, I realize that's a bold claim, and these tools are a bit more, um, certainly a lot more popular and have a lot more people working on them, but I think it's an interesting approach that has potential if we uh, keep working on it. Um, the annotations that I've used here today and the runtime extenders, particularly the one for uh, the web resources, um, these are a work in progress. Um, you know, we're not using standard namespaces and so on. We don't have those defined yet, but that's a work in progress. Um, the work that's going on here is going on uh, partially in the OSGI on route project. Um, so, um, so uh, like for example, the web resource extender is part of OSGI on route, um, and some of this is also being developed by me as part of the effective OSGI project, which is my uh, which is my book that I'm publishing uh, probably sort of middle of next year. Um, and um, my uh, examples in my book are based on this framework that I'm developing here. So um, that's the end of my slides and the, uh, the workshop. Um, any questions? Yes. 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 Right. So um, I did highlight this. At the moment, no, you can't because this version of B and D doesn't support repeating annotations. You know, j before Java eight, you couldn't have repeating annotations at all. Um, so we just needed to do a bit of work in B and D. So no, at the moment, but it certainly is the intention that will be possible. And what, sorry? Uh, ah, OK. One or two sentences about OnRoute. Um, <laughs> OSGI OnRoute is, is an on-ramp for getting started quickly with, um, with OSGI, sort of providing you an easy way to get into OSGI, because you know, we recognize that OSGI, um, there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of options and people, new people coming to OSGI felt overwhelmed with the different, you know, the hundreds of different ways of doing things. And OSGI is a, is, um, is a project that aims to give you a way to, a simple way to get a simple application started and then start building on it. This is a set of examples? And... Examples, but, but things you can actually put in production. You know, you start with that and then you build on it and you do actually have a real system at the end. But it's not part of the OSGI certification? This is, uh, it's, it's an official OSGI project but it's not a specification, although it is generating some specifications. For example, the web resource stuff, that is going to generate uh, an OSGI specification at the end of the day, um, because that's how OSGI works. You know, we, we've got this example of something to do, some ideas come out of this, and some specifications um, fall out of it. 